So Hamish has made a selection of works uh, which uh, we have as slides. Um, and we, m most of them are more recent pieces to, to what is in the exhibition. But given that uh, the context for our conversation today is uncommon ground, we, we might use this first slide as a, a kind of jumping off point for talking a little bit about um, about the period covered by, by the show. Um, so Hamish, um, this, this piece is a student work, yes. essentially. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, we could start by perhaps talking a little bit about St. Martin's, because it was obviously a very, it was an important place for the development of a new form of, of making art yeah. at the, in the late 60s. Could you tell us a little about your experience of, of being there? Well, um, thank you. Uh, I think, first of all, I want to say that I, f I feel r really extremely fortunate that I attended this non-degree course because I'm completely unqualified to have no O levels, no A levels, <laughs> no degrees, nothing. Um, and so th this course um, was very helpful for someone in my position. and. So going there, uh, I met various other artists who are actually in this um, photograph. And maybe Rolf there will remember some of the people in this photograph. Uh, standing, the second person on the left is uh, Peter Atkins, who was the senior lecturer at St. Martin's. And he helped students a great deal with regard to ideas and uh, sort of relaxing your brain a bit. And uh, so you can think about different ideas, different issues, go in different directions. You don't have to make this. You don't have to always be thinking like that. So he, he was um, r really um, uh, extremely helpful, I think, for y young people. Is it, was, is it true to say that although you were kind of nominally in the sculpture department, there was no real kind of requirement to make sculpture as such? No, that's right, yeah. It, 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 was, it was a name, it was a title, because uh, then some years later, then I remember going to art schools in London, we'd have, it would say, painting school on the door, then it would say sculpture school there, and then there'd be a space in the middle, and you go back two years later, and they'd built adjoining space, and now it all got mixed up, and so th this was part of uh, this way of thinking, that it was a sculpture non-degree course, but really, uh, what I was trying to say about Peter Atkins was that he encouraged um, people to think in different ways, not that this is sculpture, therefore this chairs, uh, uh, the sculptural chair. Uh, uh, so, so that, you know, you, to open your mind and not think, well, the door says sculpture, so therefore, consequently, you must make sculpture. I think, I think it was um, really, really important. And so from this experience, I'm lingering on it a bit long, but I think that, um, Art schools are, are really important, uh, and, I, and I, in a way, if I, it's not possible, but I would recommend that everybody went to an art school. Um, <laughs> because I think that you can think about life, the planet, the um, environment, whatever that means today, uh, in many, you have the opportunity to think in many different ways. Uh, and so I think that, that art schools are really extremely valuable. I also think that today, um, here in this um, sculpture park, that this is an interesting era that we are in with regard to um, the general public finding an interest in contemporary art, which um, not too many years ago, people would, I remember a certain show at the Haywood Gallery in the early 70s, and the, the, this word slagging off, you know, the, the, the artists were slagged off by a TV um, interviewer. And so w we've evolved on from that moment. You know, we've learned from Europe and the United States. And so, um, so I think that contemporary art can uh, uh, provide society with a sort of um, uh, outlook which they can agree with or reject. Um, so but perhaps your, your, your colleagues from St. Martin's are sort of part of initiating that process of contemporary art becoming something more um, more accessible to a general a general public perhaps yes I think I think I think that would be part of a sort of breaking down of the sort of elitism uh, difficult to understand idea you know which has taken a long time for people to come around to that, that they don't have to be frightened of contemporary art but anyway th this particular 
uh, these two walks, because the third one is 2007, which is not very long ago, but um, the, the first two were designed by myself and Richard Long, who's very uh, smartly dressed there in an overcoat. Um, we, we, we thought up this idea to walk from the corner of a, two streets in Soho, uh, walking round to the front door of St. Martin's School of Art, which might take you one and a half minutes. Yeah, it took 15 minutes. Um, and then the idea that, yes, we're in, we're in the city, so, so the, the destination of the second walk, the longer one, is actually the countryside. So you're in Charing Cross Road, and uh, you know, all the various buildings, traffic, crowds, and the idea is to, to um, uh, change, make the change, you know, transform uh, uh, the environment by walking out to the countryside, which is what we did. And in the end, nine people completed the walk. There were quite a few people uh, who dropped by the wayside, as it were, with um, sore feet and mostly lost interest. But uh, uh, seeing a double-decker bus, they changed their mind, you know. So. Um, so, but this this was really uh, you know it's fantastic uh, experience, uh, and I've, I, when I was at St Martin's, I, I've only I only have two artworks from my St Martin's time, which lasted two years. Um, this is one of them w with this added aspect of the lower walk, but uh, the other one was uh, hitchhiking times, um, where I made. Um, a list of all of the times uh, of hitchhiking where three students, uh, myself and two other students, we hitchhiked from London to Andorra and back to London again as three people. And, uh, and so I wrote down all of the times that, it, uh, that this lift, that next lift, and so on. Um, and so that, even from the point of view of um, behavior, um, I think it would be very difficult today for three males to hitchhike and get a lift, all three going into the car. So you're somewhere in France, and, and it's you know uh, half past 11, quarter to 12, and a car pulls in. Uh, Citroen, and then you know one person got in the front and two in the back. So I think that uh, the generosity of the French people at that time, that was also a big aspect of the of making this. So so these these kinds of walks, uh, artworks, were about going out onto pavements out, outside and not. Um, working from the imagination to create some uh, an abstract sculpture indoors. So the, the idea was to go out, to be influenced, to be changed, and that your ideas could work with, uh, with what was going on in life, in society, with um, music. And, and this is also 1967. Uh, it's only like 20-odd years after the end of the Second World War. And so, um, so there are quite a few barriers for young people to break through from their parents' um, Attitudes and ideas, so that so that was also going on in London, in society, in, in different countries. You know where um, the previous behaviour was being broken down and seen to be too rigid and not open and uh, accessible. And um, uh, so that 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 was this kind of feeling mm. at this time. Mm. Uh, and were you were you conscious that um, ideas about landscape um, were? were very current in the kind of artistic sort of uh, discussion at St. Martin's. Because the, the show you mentioned at the Hayward, The New Art, yes, had it, yeah. you know, the first, first kind of institutional survey of what we might call conceptual art in this country. There were 14 artists and half of them uh, were in some way making work that was about landscape or being in the landscape or... Uh, yeah. So, uh, w w was it? Were you conscious of that at the time? Um, well, th you know that's that's a long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have um, first of all, you have the issue of memory. You know, what can I remember as an old geezer? How do, how's your brain working? You know, but I, I don't really remember that um, landscape was actually a big subject. Uh, to be honest. I think that you had uh, what you could see in an art forum magazine from the United States with regard to US land art. Um, and, then, and then you would have a 1969 uh, Woodstock Rock Festival. Um, so that, and that was outside. Uh, and so there, there were some of these things, but I, don't, I didn't really feel that landscape was a sort of, at that moment, a major okay. art um, concern. Yeah. It, because, because I think that art, 
didn't really treat it as being, now, now I'm being more precise, uh, treat it as actually nature or something growing or species. It was more like a location. So the lo location could have been a field or it could be an art gallery. So I don't think it was really considered so much as landscape. Okay. Okay, um, and you mentioned America, and of course in 69, I think, you made your first trip to America, yeah. and that was important in a number of different ways for you. Um, it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about um, what you found when you arrived in New York. I think you met some interesting people there. But what, as I understand it, what was more important for you was going to the um, uh, little big horn, yeah. places like that, and sort of uh, engaging with ideas about Native American culture. Could you tell us yeah. about that? Yeah, I, you know, really, the, the, it's 1967, and Ben's asking about 1969. So in those two years, the sort of huge um, adjustments in my mind about um, what I thought was interesting and what I wanted to be concerned with. So it, it, it wasn't two years that just drifted by. It was, there, was, there was a lot, really a lot of changes in my mind. And so, as Ben said, I went to, um, with a, a friend, Nancy Wilson, we went to uh, various Native American sites in the American West, uh, it, including the Battle of the Little Bighorn site. And, and when we talk about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, then we say Crazy Horse, and then we talk about Hollywood, and then we have John Wayne, and when you get over to that edge of the story, then actually, by today's interpretation, the way that you can get rid of the case for um, land rights for Native Americans is is to think of it in terms of, uh, of uh, kind of Hollywood and Pulp Fiction, and then it becomes a form of racism. It's an extremely effective, convenient form of racism to say, oh, Battle of the Little Bighorn, Crazy Horse, Custer, oh yeah, and then, and then we, th we see John Wayne in our minds and we think Hollywood, but actually the reason that I went to this battle site was that it was this you know, classic uh, collision. And even a few years ago, I read in a book about the history of indigenous peoples in relation to other people coming from other countries. Um, was that the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn was thought of as this really classic collision between a sort of um, European, uh, obviously Western, but European military complex, let's say, that moved west wanting to complain uh, uh, not complain, to contain everything, to acquire all the land, um, uh, and it collided with the indigenous peoples who have lived there, you know, f uh, as we would say, forever. You know, they say, we didn't come from somewhere, because that's another form of racism. All the stories about people coming across the Bering Straits uh, land, uh, the frozen land uh, bridge. Um, so so that these people came from there, but then the people coming from somewhere else, European technological military, um, eventually smashed all those people. And then, and then we had the issue of um, Mount Rushmore, where you see the carved heads of the presidents. Uh, and so, so then those four or five presidents' heads are, are carved in um, actually Oglala Sioux sacred hills. So it's, it's really literally kind of issue of uh, that one group of people has great pride in seeing a giant carving of Washington or Abe Lincoln, but the other people uh, are suffering greatly because it's like pouring salt into an open wound. So, so, so these kinds of issues uh, in 1969, you know, came into my head uh, as opposed to um, uh, you know, what I was thinking about inside uh, uh, St. Martin's as a student, more to do with contemporary art, changing society, rock music, and so on. Mm. And d d was there something, did you, you found something in um, Native American Indian culture that obviously sort of resonated with you in terms of a, a philosophy of thinking about nature and the land? And you sort of began to sort of incorporate some of those ideas into your work. I'm sort of thinking about how, how you get to the point where yeah. in 1973 you say, I'm a walking artist. 
yeah. this is how this is what I have to do to make my work. Yeah, yeah. So from 1967 to 73, that's um, six years, and so I, I made different kinds of artworks. N not all of them were walks. So that would be like trying to rewrite history and make it all seem very homogenous and cool, and it's all worked out very early, because. Because scattered through there, there were different kinds of artworks that were complete failures and, you know, literally rubbish. Um, so, so that then, your your question about Native American philosophy is completely different from French gardens, let's say. You know, uh, so a totally different idea about nature. Um, because if, if you have a Zen garden, that looks natural, but it's highly controlled. Or, or you have a French classic garden, Baroque garden, then this is highly controlled. But then when you go in, into kind of a, a landscape where people, um, so to say, are living close to nature, then they, then they are thinking of nature as and the species, the various forms of life in this environment as being part of their world and that these animals are sort of equal to them, not that we are going there to control this environment. So, <laughs> are you catching that on the film, by the way? This, it really, it's not a rocking chair, but. <laughs> um, so I think that, that I, I, I was kind of wanting a kind of um, influence from uh, from people who feel very, very strongly about. No, I'll, I'll try not to move so much. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so I think that. Native Americans are one of many groups of people in the world. Australian Aboriginal people, for example, would be another, um, because, you know. So, yeah. So it's, it's a big, mm, it's a big kind mm. of issue. But it, but basically, um, it's always people, indigenous peoples today, I believe, lead the way for um, technological society to reconsider nature, and and not that technological societies must always be thinking about mining. Uh, so. When, when you have um, Aboriginal sites that have been uh, damaged um, last year, there was a famous court case in Australia where a bulldozer smashed into a sacred site, Aboriginal sacred site. So, uh, and, th and they were actually prosecuted. The mining company was prosecuted. So that's completely different. You know, it offers a, another way of thinking about nature and the planet. And so that, so that, that's, that, that's the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the feeling, the thinking that I, that I had. And then, of course, then you have all the issue of, of rights of, you know, that these people came from this land, but, but those people, the native people, they had no concept of ownership. And then they collided with people who applied the rules of ownership onto them. And then they failed the test, and then their land was stolen. Mm. Okay, um, and thinking again about sort of transitional periods in in the early work, um, if it, some of you may have seen the show already, if not, you might be going over there afterwards. What what you will see is a group of works by Hamish, and the the earliest pieces are sort of collages, almost of yeah. photographic images. Yeah. Um, not like this. Not like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, where you're kind of making connections between different places, different times and yes. things. But then you, then you start to use single images yes. and, the, and the works yes. become sort of yeah. tied to yeah. an idea of walking. Yes, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the artworks that I made that Ben's referring to often um, consisted of either three photographs joined up or four photographs joined up. Um, and that, you could easily say, had to do with photography, graphics, um, not really graphics perhaps, photography, um, the way of, of relating four photographs, how do these, how will these four photographs relate together, which, you know, is a totally different preoccupation than the, the, what you're then saying, um, where the photograph became a single photograph. So then the single photograph then allowed me to relate to a, a text below the photograph that related to what you were looking at, either directly or completely obliquely in, in the photograph. So the, the, the works that in the exhibition where you have four, then, then this is much more to do with um, uh, photography um, in, in a kind of straightforward photography sense. Mm. And, and you, it seems that you had a sort of breakthrough in terms of thinking about what you were doing and what you wanted to do. Um, I mean, it's oft, often quoted, but you made the 
a walk uh, the length of the length of the British Isles, uh, Duncansby Head to Lands End, yeah. and then you kind of said, okay. This is, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to codify my practice. I'm going yeah. to set myself rules uh, that I'm. I have to walk to make work. Yeah, yeah. That 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 was the um, uh, the final kind of moment because I, I'd made uh, say a walk across the neck of England in 1971 uh, from the west coast to the east coast. So that, but then I would make. Uh, other works which were just a collection of black and white photographs uh, as we were just mentioning so th these two kinds of ways of working uh, were kind of going on and on and on and then and then eventually as Ben said in 1973 I made this walk of over a thousand miles and then that was so amazing uh, as an experience that it completely converted me to uh, making only art about the experience of individual walks okay and one of the things that you were keen to do today was to um, dispel the notion that you are a solitary walker, exclusively solitary walker. Exclusively, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think um, it's interesting, in the, in the exhibition there are walks yeah. that are solitary, but equally yeah. there's work from um, a visit to Bolivia where you were with Richard Long. Yeah. Uh, you said that you were with Nancy when you went to yeah. Montana. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting thinking about the student work uh, at St. Martin's as a, you know, constructing a group experience. This has become a more, an increasingly important part of your work in recent years, in the last decade, perhaps? Uh, well, uh, 94 walks. was really when I okay. started, and then, and then you're right, then more recent, yeah. in more recent years, yeah. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about group walking and why that's important? Um, well, w one, one way of thinking about it is that um, if, uh, if, we, if we see an artwork on a wall in a gallery, then um, the people who are looking at it didn't make the artwork and they, they weren't in, if it's my work, they, they didn't make the walk. So in this case, then, when, when, you, when I would make design a, a public walk, this one in Spain, for example, um, then what I say is that the walking participant is also the art observer. So that, um, we don't need to go back to the other slide, but the other slide showed um, uh, a walk, public walk, communal walk, are made in Margate, um, in England, uh, where there was um, the wall of a bathing pool in a square, which was above the sea level, and then people, 198 people, walked seven times around on the wall, and so uh, I was, at the time, kind of involved in trying to explain about trying to get everybody equally spaced and so on. And then finally, I was able to get up onto the wall myself. I stood on the wall, I looked around, I just said, why, this is, it just looked absolutely fantastic. So, so that's, you know, I'm the artist, but, um, <laughs> but the, the feeling was that um, it wasn't really that you were inside your mind doing this walk, like perhaps you, perhaps, maybe you might be if you were a solitary walker. So that when you join with you know a lot of other people, then then is a there is a communal interest, a communal energy sometimes, uh, but also there is the visual aspect of the communal walk, the way that it actually looks, and then in the case of the one in Margate, uh, it it was on a wall which then when people came off, then the tide came in and completely covered the wall. So you, there, were no, there were no more, uh, no, no wall for people to walk on. So, so it's very, you know, it's sort of real, actual, but also sort of symbolic that um, I didn't build anything. You know, sometimes I say, uh, you know, I, I, I built an experience. Um, so, so the wall would be th thought of as sculptural or sculpture, but I didn't make it myself. It was already there in the first place, and I used what was existing. Mm. And, and some of these group walks are quite challenging for the participants, but in unexpected ways. You know, so n no one's asked to walk for a thousand miles or anything, but they might be yeah. asked to walk a few meters, but over an extended period of time, or? Yeah, yeah, like a, a line of people, maybe say a line of people across here, taking, well, if it, if it was here, <laughs> literally this space, 
it would take, you know, you'd have your heels there and it would take you one hour to walk from there and have the toes of your shoes uh, on the edge of the stage. So it's that, it's that kind of um, uh, ratio of uh, time and distance. And I guess in doing that, you're making people super aware of their own movements, their, their place in relation to other... Yes. The space that they're in, yeah, the but, passage but, but, of time. Yeah, but, but, uh, but because um, we're in a sculpture park, then I, I don't want to sort of um, give the impression that this... Because that then we have this word space, you know. And so th this is more like distance, I would say. Uh, okay. This is more like distance, not space. Yeah. Because space quite often is the space between something, whereas in this case it's um, the distance that you traverse, you know, looking at your watch all the time to make yeah. sure that in half an hour you're just about there. Yeah, so. yeah. and, I th and I, you know, going back to the early 70s again, I think that, that those are interesting ideas you just um, explained because there were a number of attempts to kind of describe your work as sculpture. Yes, at yeah. that time, yeah. sort of using those concepts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which of course you, you know, you've rejected. Yeah. So, um. But at, but at the time when people spoke like that, because I remember there was an article in Art International, I think by Rudy Fuchs. I'm not 100 percent sure. I think that's who it was, where he said that if somebody walks up and down, uh, you know, over a few hills like that, then then what it what it me what what we can say is that the walker. It, uh, um, is describing the contours of the ground by walking with their, you know, their body. So therefore, this becomes sculptural, you know. So I, I think that this is just people trying to, um, you know, try something on, really, um, because it, it, it's, it's not really a sort of story that holds water, I don't think. Um, but at that time, you're right that in, in the early 70s, um, basically, people didn't have anything to. Um, to reference, they didn't really have anything to refer to, because art historians don't ever do any research into walking. You know, that's it's a statement, but that is the way it is. They 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 research art, but they don't research walking. So um, so then all all this kind of art became um, uh, it, it had to do with the with the issue of. Um, painting from the past, which people who attended the Courtauld Institute would know all about, and then land art, US land art, uh, and then British and European Japanese outdoor sculpture. So there's plenty of material to reference all of that. But when it comes to just gradually thinking about just walking as, as walking, but within the context of contemporary art, um, then, then they weren't really able to, um, to do that, which is in retrospect, fair enough, really, because there wasn't a lot of material to reference to think in these terms. Well, I mean, it's a natural. People naturally want to kind of categorise things, don't yeah. they? And you've uh, remained uncategorizable. You, you, you're a category of one. What a walking artist. <laughs> um, well, well, I, th I think it's I think it's important to um, sort of guide um, you know what your dream is really, rather than be told what your dream is you know by people who are not particularly interested. Let's say you know. So and it's interesting because I, I was reading again in the early seventies. You, you talked for a period, uh, but you oh, gave it up because you. Yeah. Uh, I think you used the word guilt. You felt. Guilt about. Um, yeah, about the, yeah. Only taught for about six months <laughs> in 1970, and then th then this issue. It's, it's, it sounds um, arrogant, but but it was a kind of idea in 1970 where I, I really felt I I, I I shouldn't be doing this, but uh, and, and that I should become you know an artist who just worked all the time w without without being employed, without being distracted to somewhere else, and so that's what I thought in 1970, but. But today, like I said at the very beginning, that uh, I completely believe in art schools and um, the, you know, the opportunity that art education offers. So I wouldn't want anyone to think at all that I am not interested in art schools or art education. I am. But at that time, it, it felt like a complete um, cop-out. Mm. It, to, is, um, to be an artist, is that a moral, is there a moral obligation? Uh, we've been, while well, we've been talking, there have been images coming up of, that address uh, the situation in Tibet mm -hmm. at the moment, China, and so on. Yeah. Do you feel as an artist that you have a moral role to play within society? 
Um, well, wh when I started, well, because now I'm like, swerving to, um, <laughs> to uh, Tibet and China, um, the thing that you can read is uh, where it may be not even always Tibetans. It can be people from other countries and other situations where they say that people out in the so-called free world, because we, if we're in this country and we say, well, we don't like the policy of George Osborne, and so, so we complain about our country. But really, what's going on inside this country uh, is a far cry from what goes on inside other, you know, the, the politics and the, the status of the individual in other countries it can be extremely severe and we wouldn't last five minutes in some of these places, you know. So what, what you can read is that um, they, they ask, they say, you who, ha who are fortunate to be living in the West and have this opportunity to say something, please use your freedom to point to our lack of freedom. And, and I think then, then this, instead of it being, um, you know, going into depressing politics, I think it, it has to do with uh, freedom of expression. And, and, and surely that's what art's about. It's, it's connected, directly connected to freedom of expression. And then uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of, freedom of media and so on. And some countries don't have any of that. Mm. But we were talking at lunch about the fact that so much of contemporary art is apolitical. It doesn't take a position on anything other than aesthetics. But you clearly feel the need to take a position. Well, because I, I think that, um, you know, I'm an artist. I'm not, uh, didn't, didn't, I don't have a MA in politics. I, it's a sort of, I, I'm viewing it from the point of view of art. And, and I do think that where I've perhaps seen a play about a, a political issue that in a two hour play, I can gain very much more just from two hours watching a play rather than reading, you know, volumes which I can't really understand because I'm not qualified. You know, the, the gist of the story can be conveyed through different forms of art, I think. I mean, I hope that would be, that's the intention. Can we, as we've got this image up here, can we talk a little bit about words? Because um, I think, you know, you, you started to use words in conjunction with photographic images yeah, in the 70s. Yeah. And then at some point in the 80s, you started to kind of just actually present work as words without images. Yeah. And again, that's become an increasingly sort of important part of, the, of what you do. This is a large scale wall work, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a wall painting, it's, yeah. it's paint, yeah. Um, what was the, how did you kind of make that sort of break, how did you dispense with the image and just rely, how can you just rely on words and get rid of the image? Um, well, I think one, one kind of quick, easy answer is that, um, I don't want to get the, mess the microphone up, but I, I always carry, you know, notebooks and a notebook's no good unless you have a pen, so I've got a pen and even the pen has four colours, so um, I can, you know, make art as I'm kind of walking along and sometimes I've, I've even actually been going kind of like that, you know, writing, so um, so that, that's the kind of practical functional aspect of it. Um, and then the, the truth is that really I kind of come and go with regard to photography because photography can, you, you can say, oh, well, this is a very beautiful landscape photograph, um, uh, but we, we can't really know what's happening in the atmosphere, you know, because recently of all, with regard to all of the pollution in the air down in the south, I think it came up this way a little bit, but, um, because I remember reading in a book called The End of Nature by Bill McKibben, where he said, you know, you look at the clouds and they look beautiful, it's a summer day, but actually the material inside, the particles are actually, you know, coming from, uh, they, they are actually polluting, you know. The, so, so you can have, so how to use photography. If you, if you photograph um, somebody being murdered or shot, then this, then this is used as evidence. So, so photography can be thought of as evidence, uh, but but then if it's a, a landscape, then you, we don't see it as evidence of the condition of the landscape. We see it as um, you know a beautiful landscape, you know, like a well composed, good tone, good proportion, and so on. You know. So, do you kind of you're finding yourself veering too close to a kind of traditional notion of the painterly, you know? It, it, uh, partly, yes, yes, that's right. That that would definitely be the 
original kind of push. But then my mind sort of comes and goes a bit. Uh, I, 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 haven't ma I haven't made a kind of a plan to dispense with photography because, because there is the evidence aspect. And, um, and so, you know, the, the issue of walking is, can, can you prove that you went there? Can you prove you did this, you know? Um, so sometimes I sort of think a little bit that the photograph provides some element of um, evidence. Well, when, when, we, when we worked together on your Tate show, I remember that a lot of people said to me, uh, you know, how, how, do, how do I know he walked all that way? Yeah. Uh, why should I trust him? Yeah. And um, of course, <coughs> We just have to trust you, don't we? <laughs> um, but every now and then, though, um, th th there can be evidence that's outside of myself. For instance, the um, Everest, yeah. Everest summit uh, photograph. Um, that you know that all of that that, that that the expedition was recorded online. So, and then and then there are witnesses. So we know you went to the summit of Everest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As for this lot. <laughs> Yeah, because, well, because because fact and fiction is a kind of major issue in our kind of the way that we relate to media. So, you know, well, I mean, I try to get more, one of my sayings right is that um, walks are facts for the walker and fiction for everyone else. That's one of my sort of art statements. And um, so that, uh, you know, two people walk off around the corner and they know that they, you know, walk to the other side of the country, but other people may not. Mm may not believe it but if you are it's a bit like with the, the group walking then public communal walking then if you have a group of people then they they verify that each other <laughs> we were we were all there you know yeah. so so I think fact and fiction um, then that really plays into the issue of media in our lives you know internet media yeah. um, press whatever it may be and and of course press and media can't completely alter uh, the story, the facts, they can be working for the newspaper publisher, they can be working for a government, they can be working for a corporation, and the facts uh, have been, you know, twisted to fit a box, you know. Well, it's, it's normal, I think. Um, but one last thing, and then perhaps we'll open it up to, to questions from the audience. Um, the the if, image of the summit of Everest, mm -hmm. you know, is extraordinary. Um, and mountaineers and the practice of sort of mountaineering and exploring uh, have been important for you. Um, you climbed Everest as an artist, yeah. not as a, as a mountaineer. Yeah. And I just wonder if you could say, say something about that, about why, why mountaineer, what, what is the example that mountaineers have given yeah. that it is so interesting? Yeah, I, I think um, I think about 1977 I started going to um, climbing expedition lectures in London by people such as Doug Scott and, um, and then reading expedition books because I felt that um, the way that the landscape had sort of gone, then, then it was being referred to too much in terms of Turner and Constable uh, or Caspar Friedrich. It wasn't even Taoist paintings. They weren't, they weren't, they could easily, because they are the first landscape, so-called landscape paintings, I think the Chinese um, Taoist paintings. But um, so, so I felt it, it was all kind of drifting away from some, the, the experience, you know, that, that um, landscape became photography, sculpture, a painting, but it didn't become walking. So in order to be, sort of receive inspiration from other human beings, then I, then I started going to these various lectures and reading. And then of course, then I was, <laughs> sort of the, you know, the power worked on me. <laughs> and then I, um, you know, was extremely fortunate to uh, work with a German gallery who helped to raise the funding for me to become a client on a commercial expedition to climb Mount Everest. And as uh, Ben's alluding to the fact that it, um, it was 2009, and in 2009 there should have been nine places, but because of the economy, there were only six people on this particular expedition, and then two people decided not to continue. So that left four of us um, going going up there. And um, so, but you can't you can't possibly go there uh, as a contemporary artist. You you go there because you're going with Sherpas. I mean, this is this is essentially important fact to uh, you know to state very clearly that um, 
you know, I was helped up and down by um, Sherpas, not literally, as Doug Scott says, like a dog on a leash. It's not quite, it's, it, but that's, it's a very good statement though. Um, so so I, somebody like myself with my limited skill, you can't go up there unless, um, unless you're, you're, you're helped by, you know, Sherpas. So that, that's really important. But in terms of what people look like, the other three people, you know, I'm the, I was the oldest one, and then the other three guys, they were business executives. And so, but when you got everything on and a mask, everybody looks the same. You couldn't tell an artist from a CEO, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, you know, Everest sits on the border with, you know, between Nepal and, mm. Tibet. Yeah, <laughs> and you cross without a passport control yeah. <laughs> very high <laughs> into Tibet and then go back into Nepal again. And w w w were those sort of geographical considerations, were they factors in the sort of decision to, to make that journey to the summit? There we, there we have the image. Yeah. Um, that, that's actually um, a, a Buddha, a small Buddha which is, has been wrapped by the Sherpas in uh, cattle scarves and um, Prayer flags, and um, <laughs> the, uh, now we're going off the topic slightly. But the, the man on the right, um, he he came from um, Macedonia, and it was kind of amazing. But you're sort of sitting there in a tent. Uh, getting to know the other people that you're with and then gradually people's life stories come out and uh, Sasko Kadev uh, on the right there he he was uh, the runner-up for the running for president of Macedonia <laughs> <laughs> he, he also um, invented the dissolving stent because he's a world famous um, what's the correct not heart surgeon but heart specialist anyway and so you know, he gave us great big long, uh, like two or three hour talks about amazing stories of uh, not, not operating on the heart, but coming through with uh, maybe people, maybe there's a doctor here, I don't know. Um, so, so you meet people that have extraordinary other lives, you know, but then it is, it is really overpowering though. The, when you finally leave the tent, after all this sort of talking and eating and drinking and everything, and you, you actually, this is the time when you're finally gonna go up. You, you can feel that you've sort of, you set off on something where m maybe you're not gonna come back, you know, because it's a bit like, You've been driving around all these different places and now you go down this other road, it's completely new, you don't know anything, you know, so you can't tell what, what might happen to your body, to your heart or your brain or your lungs. Um, uh, and so in order that, that it's uh, arrived at, and, and, and more importantly, that you come down safely because basically your mind starts to, um, uh, it's kind of lost its energy on the way down and the body's losing its energy and so that's exactly when you make a terrible mistake you know mm. so so it's really totally extraordinary but a lot of people don't like the idea they say oh you know this is um you know it's uh, it's it's anti nature you're 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 going there and uh, you you're walking over other people's dead bodies you're uh, contributing to garbage on the mountain uh, 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 you know there's a whole long list of and, and also it's not mountaineering, it's actually not mountaineering, it's high altitude trekking, so it's, you can't say that you climbed it, you didn't, it was high altitude trekking. So a huge amount of anti uh, going up Everest by the uh, southeast ridge, but w when you go there yourself, it's absolutely mind-blowing. So, so there is this two-story kind of idea. Mm. Okay, shall we um, open it up to questions from the audience at this point? At the beginning, Hedge, you drew a comparison between two different cultural responses to the environment, one of control uh, and one of more or less complete acceptance. The strongest feature in your work is one of very measured mathematical precision in terms of numbers and letters and lettering and presentation. Can you say something about that? Uh, what, what I say is that um, my artworks equal control and my walks equal freedom. So, um, so absolutely, it's, it's kind of uh, it, it, exactly as you said. But the, the, where it comes from is a kind of, um, is, is not really, I mean, this, this doesn't, well, what I say is um, an artwork cannot represent the experience of a walk. So. 
maybe that's sort of where your question is, you know, that, that really this is not like making the, it's not really presenting the audience, the, the viewer, with um, something similar to the experience. It, it's not possible. Equally, there, there must be many occasions where you are planning to walk for X number of days from to a particular place and due to circumstances beyond your control, uh, weather, whatever, you, you can't do that. Yeah. So you have to kind of deal with yeah. that, yeah. The kind of the unpredictability of walking in nature. Absolutely, yeah. It's yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really important point. I mean, there's so many things that uh, that, I, that I haven't said because the the time. But um, it, it is really when we're used to moving things around on a laptop, and then and then you know now you put the laptop down, you go out the door, you go, and now as Ben says, you know now now there's a sort of you know 120 mile an hour wind blowing at you or something. Then. That, that the 120 mile an hour wind is a reality and you can't move forward in that so you, you have to change your mind and, and go back if you want to live so so th these are um, very real uh, uh, movements as opposed to moving lettering around on a, on a layout for one of these tags in terms of the time you've been walking um, are there changes to do with your ageing and your level of fitness mm. and do you expect that to be, uh, to think of somebody who knows how hard it is now to climb up the mountain, um, do you expect to, to, to see an artistic response to that difference in your relationship to the landscape and your activity of walking? Yeah, very good question, thank you. I, I think um, that it, it, it is kind of there are various things going on simultaneously, and um, physical aging deterioration is running parallel to being creative and making art. You know, so um, so one of the, one of my little kind of statements is, you know, the first seven steps and then the last seven steps. So the first seven steps that you make as a child, baby, and then your last seven steps before you pass away or are killed. So I think that. It, it is a kind of lifespan idea, you know, that um, at a certain point somewhere in, in one year, you know, uh, maybe you weren't, I wasn't really trying to walk as far as possible, but that, but in retrospect, it turns out on the record that that was the, far, the longest walk I made, you know, even though I wasn't trying to do it from the point of view of how far can I walk, you know. So then, so then if you leave it a bit too long, then aging, physical deterioration, ah, you can't go back and add on another 500 kilometers to that best. So, so a aging and deterioration is it's, it's all built in, you know, it's, it's inescapable, you know, you can't. Do, do you feel it's important to kind of test yourself physically, is that? I, I, think, it's, I think it's important to have um, these experiences. I, I think that's it's really, yeah, to, you know. Are, to, are, the, are the experiences often richer if you're physically tested. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then you see, then, uh, but then you, you have a problem then because um, if, if you apply that to um, world-class um, Himalayan climbing, um, then people do this climb and it's amazing, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Uli Steck, um, Swiss, a Swiss climber. So if you want to see something a little bit extraordinary, uh, uh, YouTube Uli Steck, uh, two hours, 47 minutes, uh, climbing uh, the, the north face of the Eiger solo without rope. So, um, so the, the, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just leaving to Google Uli Steck. <laughs> Um, well, uh, another great question. Thank you. Um, so it's a bit like when somebody says, um, "How do you decide where to go? How, wh how do you decide to make? Where will you go next?" Or what, what? because what it is is that it is, if you have a blank table like that, and then there's then the, I start. I have one walk, then I have two walks. Now I've got ten walks, and so 
if the table is my sort of lifespan, then um, the different walks then build up kind of interconnections. And that's how I sort of move forward and choose what to do next because of wanting to, um, like on the, the map of Western Europe, you know, to make, to, to make these interconnections. Or this piece here. So having, having been to the highest point in South America, Yes. Going to the highest point in North America is a kind of is a, is a, a logical next step there. Yeah. Yeah. Because the the the, the Aconcagua that I went there twice. So the first time there was it wasn't 120 miles an hour, but it was you couldn't um, stand up in it. So so we couldn't continue. So um, we actually had to put giant rocks on the inside of the tent. Normally you have a tent and people, you think have the guy ropes and you put rocks like that. In this case, we had to put the rocks inside, you know, because the, the whole thing would then take off. And I've already I have lost two tents that went. One in Switzerland went went straight up. It didn't go down. It went up and it disappeared. <laughs> anyway, I must. I don't want to get too carried away with it. <laughs> Yeah, in the back. I think um, one, one of the things that you do that is wonderful is um, raise our sort of levels of attentiveness and uh, sensitivity to various things in the landscape that I think are incredibly important. And at least two of us here think of uh, your work, Rock, Fall, Echo, Dust, as absolutely iconic, you know, resonates, it's beautiful. But what I just wanted to um, reflect on a moment, related to things about which you spoke, is that a lot that you do invites us to consider our freedom to roam, our freedom yeah. to walk, which is not a given, no. I think. Yeah. And uh, various issues to do with land ownership, for yeah. example. Yeah. You touched upon mining. Now, last night I attended a talk on fracking in uh, yeah. our local oh, yeah. town. It's very interesting. And somebody said, whether this is true or not, that in Australia, where there's a great deal of this, and the fracking takes place not in the desert, but in the most fertile part of the land, that actually what people own is the top four inches of soil. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, yeah. And I think, uh, I'm just interested in, you know, thinking about the relationship between your walking and space, uh, artistic space and landscape space. Uh, is, your work, is your walk of distance and surface and so on, um, have you done something, what might you do about the down there, the bit that we don't consider? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for that. I, uh, I I didn't know about that dimension. It might not be right, but I suspect <laughs> it might. Well, it must apply to some. So, I mean, there was talk in this country because something that just recently happened, I think, in government that we haven't read, which raises all sorts of questions <clears throat> yeah. about how the land underneath us yeah. might be exploited mm. without our permission. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can really answer, you know, or make a comment exactly. But I think that um, today, what what happens is that when when we have a, a problem, two different sides colliding over an issue, that um, that the the side who who has the the you know less firepower. Um, in, in the way that they speak, they speak as though they're halfway in agreement already with the corporation or the government or whatever it may be. So, so that when you would come back to something very fundamental, uh, where you're trying to sort of arrive, say, say a country's invaded and it's, it's completely taken over, like, uh, like Tibet invaded by the Chinese, that what the Chinese say is, sometimes is that you can talk about every, everything and anything except sovereignty. So of course this is the first question. We want to talk immediately about sovereignty, not not um, sort of put it to the side, you know. So so I think it's what you're saying about the four inches below, this is completely absurd because if you're on the top, <laughs> you know, the, the, I think I think a lot of things, uh, because of very smart lawyers, uh, you know, the stories get really skewed in favor of who's paying the most, as it were. Have you um, have you been a trespasser? Well, surely everyone's been <laughs> uh, deliberately. 
uh, well, over, I mean, over not not in recent times deliberately, but over the years, I, of course, like everyone else, I've been trespassing. <laughs> so it's a great word, isn't it? Yeah. I was always influenced by that idea of walking, and what I kind of felt was it is a way to confront the sheer physicality of your surroundings. You're walking towards it over stones or a tree or something. Now, what interests me a little bit, also aging, is surely your age must change that confrontation of the physicality of your surroundings. Your perception must altogether change. Yes, yes. very interesting. I think, I, I, yeah. I, I, I think I, your, your records will change. Yeah. No, that that must be that must be true, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, all I can say is yes, I agree that that that, that, that aging does. Yeah, be, because it. it um, um, I can't think of an example, but. Yeah, you, yeah. The, your the way that your your mind w works, you know, is is an old brain. So therefore, it's not that you've got a like an old body and a, a young idea or something you know it's, it's, so it's to do with, i think uh, the question is about perception maybe yeah yeah but but that it also depends on what you've done because if you go to somewhere where um, people have spent their whole lives and now they're in their 80s or, ni or uh, let's say 80s that they um the the, the the way that they live their lives in kind of very harsh conditions you know that that is their life that's and so those harsh conditions for 85 years is what you know the body is a, a sort of product of the of the harshness and so then that, that will alter your perception because uh, and, and what you can do and where you can go because um, uh, you know I've been with some people who are older and they they say oh I, I did all this and the, you know like in Switzerland I climbed this I went up here went down there and but they, they they can't do it now but they did they did do it then so it's, it's sort of it's related I think but it's an interesting thing to consider all that yeah Nick Thank you. yes I was going to Ask a question about um, your relationship to mountaineering and particularly um, the way that you have been sometimes preferred um, writers or mountaineers to write about your work rather than art critic, should we say? But, and linking that with the ideas about uh, age and endurance, because um, quite an early stage in your practice, you you kind of upped the game, didn't you? You started doing really quite formidable walks, which uh, would be beyond the uh, capacity of most art students, I suspect. The <laughs> uh, um, imaginary privileges um, youth, well, just, and you can't um, operate as an engineer at the, at the top of your game for very many years. It's, it's, it's quite a um, mm. sport in that respect. You just, you just sort of, indicated. Um, could you just say something about you know, when your interest in mountaineering began? Did you always have it? Did you have it back in 67? And, uh, and how do those analogies between uh, what you do, a walking artist, and, and the sort of um, the world of mountain walking, mountain climbing? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, as, as I was saying about 1977, that's when I needed, I needed to sort of go to some people to hear something, to see something, to find out about people that were actually going about on the ground, or uh, in this case, you know, rock climbing and mountaineering. Um, and they, you know, the, the thing with the Himalayan expedition is that you have to do the, the mountaineer does the trek, the climb, and then the trek, whereas the trekker just does the trek in the trek back out again. So all of those sorts of thoughts, you know, um, you know, really started to um, work on my mind. And then, but, but, but it takes years and years and years to, uh, it took me, you know, until 2000, um, the year 2000, when I, uh, I did a walk in, 
in Switzerland where I got, had the experience of getting snow blind. Um, and then I sort of recovered from that, had an exhibition, sold some artwork, got some money, and then bought a place on a Choyo Yu uh, Himalayan expedition to climb uh, Choyo Yu in Tibet. And um, so uh, I, I remember that the, the expedition leader is a really nice person. But when I said, you know, I, I didn't know how to do this, and I didn't know how to do that, and I didn't know how to fit that on, and I did, you know, it's just like, this, this guy's a complete liability, you know, and I remember he, 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 had, he sort of went, I'm going in for another tea, and he went back into the tent and made another, you know, was, I know you should have had a double whiskey or something, but really, um, so, so that kind of, that, that going to Choyo Yu, uh, going up to above 8,000 meters without bottled oxygen, th this was, um, you know, completely life-changing, and I think uh, I was actually greatly helped by doing this sort of small walk in Switzerland and getting, getting um, snow blindness, because then you sort of realize that, oh, I got snow blindness without realizing that I could get it, you see, because it, uh, I know that I'm going into too many details, but actually I was going along in the snow, the sun, or the cloud came and blocked out the sun, and that became a dull gray color. So I'm, I'm just like an ignorant idiot, you know. And so I took off the sunglasses and went along in the dark gray. Of course, the quantity of ultraviolet in this gray cloud is gigantic. So after I've only gone a short distance I, like that, and then eventually it's, it's really like someone's poured sand into your eyes, you know, and it lasts for a few days. So, um, so even with even looking like an idiot wearing two pairs of sunglasses is still really, you know, <laughs> really burning you know so so that so that this kind of all these little moments you know they all sort of contribute and um, and, th and then I did take the, the sort of the plunge as it were and I knew that I would end up looking like an idiot going you know with people that knew what they were doing on going to Choi Yu but nevertheless um, nevertheless I think all the treks that I'd done really helped me slogging up through snow slopes you know um, and, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, being an idiot, unfortunately, uh, I did uh, get uh, frostbite in two toes on that. Um, and so the, the sort of the range of things that can happen to you are not, you know, I've kind of drifted in this, what I'm saying now, it's drifted out of art making, contemporary art, contemporary ideas, what medium do you use, you know, are you a sculptor, are you a land art? You know, it's sort of drifted into, um, when, when we went up and came back down for above, from above 8,000 meters, came down to the tent and um, the, not the expedition leader that I was with, another one said to his um, Sherpa, put me, put, put him in the tent with the two uh, Mexican climbers, because I was on an expedition with two fantastic Mexican climbers who live in Mexico City, obviously, and they train on Popa Catapetl, so their, their lung power and everything's, you know, they were the best by far. So I went into the tent and they, they weren't Mexican, they were Spanish, they were Basque. So I went into the tent because the Sherpa thought they were Mexican. Went into the tent and um, the, the mat, there were three of us could be in this space in the tent, but the space that I was allocated to had had sunlight that was on that side and it, it had melted a gigantic hole in the snow. So you see that, that looks like the tent uh, ground sheet actually went when you went onto it, it went poof, down like that so I spent the night you know uh, like that with my stomach down like that so um, so and then you, you see you have the most amazing um, uh, chemical uh, dots and stars and all, uh, patterns and everything going on inside your eyes you know uh, because of uh, altitude and the, the blood's not flowing correctly you know so <clears throat> These, these two people, they, they were not very well at all. Uh, the, the, the man at the, uh, far away in the farthest point in the tent, you know, he, he hardly moved at all. And one next to me, I said, could you move just slightly? So, so that's what um, happened. And then the, uh, the next morning, the, t the other tent that I went to was where that box is. And the, the man, Sherpa from the, that tent said, uh, would, you, would I like some tea? And I said, yes. And I just um, got up and I went out and I had my inner boots on, but I didn't have my outer boots. So at 7,500 meters, you go from here to there and I got frostbite because I wasn't wearing, you know, the correct outer boots. And, and I went into the tent and the, the expedition leader said, okay, let, let's see your fingers. So he looked at my fingers, it's not, let's look at your toes. I thought, oh, my toes are fine, look, frostbite. So, so then the amazing issue of, uh, um, you know, uh, evacuation, which was, uh, I, don't, I don't need to go on about all this, I'm sorry, but it, 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 was, very, it was very gripping, you know, the, the whole issue to, to um, 
get, you know, get out quick, you know. So, um, so this uh, lead climber Sherpa, you know, I, I sort of like, uh, I, went, uh, I was hanging over his shoulder, you know, abseil down the front, down there. Another guy helped me across a river because you can't get your feet wet. Um, and then he go to down to where the where the road where the track is, and try and get a, a vehicle. And then no vehicle. And then in the middle of the night, a vehicle finally arrived when everyone was cross-eyed with exhaustion. You get into the truck and go across the altiplano in the dark. You know, it's it's all incredible stuff. And um, so that does feed into. Uh, perceptions uh, as an artist, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm kind of taking this all in as an artist. We have one last question. I think some, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm quite interested in what you've said about it. It sounds sort of like an addiction, like a bit addictive to it. And I'm curious about how you sort of manage that and obviously now, when I used to be climbing, I'm walking, and I wonder, like, what your relationship is to that in the fact that it, you know this walking and this climbing, like, there's a certain sort of, um, oh, I don't know, like, a death wish to it, or like, you know, there's a bit into it, you want to keep going and get to a higher point, or you've got to a higher point now, but, you know, and doing your challenge and things. And I wonder, as an artist, like, how, well, as a person, how about it to you, but then also as an artist, how do you get over that sense of risk? Mm. It, well, it's a, it, it is a very um, strange kind of uh, position to occupy because um, I, I made a, one, one of the Everest um, text works I made was um, I had it's the title of the artwork is um, the the names of thank you very much <laughs> the, um, the names of um, seven men because there there, there are no women and uh, so the. So, that, so I'm an artist, and so this text is about Everest. And so the, the top name is Duchamp. Then the next name is Messner. And then the third name is Habler. And so Peter Habler was uh, with Reinhold Messner. They were the two first people to climb Everest without bottled oxygen. And, and uh, everyone said that their brains would, um, brain cells would be burned out. But the, the reason for starting with Duchamp was really uh, sort of two reasons that I, I thought that the artwork Fountain made in 1917 is kind of eternally, um, uh, I, I can't think of the right words to say, but amazing. That's, that's not a very good word. Um, uh, and that people who knew um, Habler wouldn't know Duchamp, and people who knew Duchamp would never have heard of Peter Habler. So, it, so what, you, what you're talking about are these different worlds, um, the, the world of contemporary art and the world of uh, contemporary whatever it might be, you know, rock climbing, mountaineering, because uh, there, there are so many different um, possibilities, uh, long distance trekking and so on. Um, so it, it, it is a very sort of strange place where, where, where whereas, um, it, we're here in the sculpture park, and we say British sculpture. You see, British sculpture is is a sort of giant. Um, it's like a giant corporation. It's, it's, it's enormous. Whereas walking art is is in its infancy. So so the, 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 it's all out of balance. You know, the British sculpture. You know, it's um, it's it's a force to be reckoned with. Whereas walking art, it, it's just kind of like a bit odd. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> three-letter word. I just wanted to thank Hamish and Ben for having an interesting discussion with coming here today, and to wish you all the best for future projects and adventures. Thank you. And to thank everybody else for coming today as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.